we recognized as, as a society, we have to start thinking about our brain health much earlier. Absolutely. And thinking about, you know, it just like we think about our, our physical health, just like we think about why do we brush and floss our teeth every day? Yep. Because we need them to last our whole life, right? You're listening to Decoding Healthcare Innovation with Carrie Nixon and Rebecca Gwilt, a podcast for novel and disruptive business leaders seeking to transform how we receive and experience healthcare. Hi, everyone. I'm Carrie Nixon with Decoding Healthcare Innovation. Today, for this episode, I'm joined by Russ Glass, who is the newly named CEO of Headspace Health formerly known as the CEO of Ginger. Russ, I'm so glad you're with us today. Thanks for having me. Good to see you. Absolutely. So there has been a much talked about merger between Headspace and Ginger, and the new entity is Headspace Health. You were originally involved with Ginger, and I'm wondering if you could start off by telling us a little bit about Ginger's mission and how it, mer- how it evolved and merged with Headspace Health. Sure. Ginger is, is one of those companies that has recognized for a lot, I think a lot longer than the general public, just how important mental health is. And, and they, they saw, I mean, they were founded in, I guess, 2011. And the founders just saw this huge issue where people had this, this set of mental health needs, but didn't, couldn't find enough support. There weren't enough providers out there to deliver the care people needed. Now, what we've seen since then is obviously the world is, has caught up to the understanding of just how important mental health is and how it affects downstream health issues and how our, our kids are having more and more anxiety, depression, suicidality. And Ginger's whole reason for being is to solve this problem, solve the supply demand imbalance. And um, so, you know, coming together with Headspace is, is, for a number of reasons, extremely exciting for us. So I wanna dive into that a little bit more shortly, but before we do so, I wanna talk a little bit about you as an innovator in particular. So you come from a background in Silicon Valley where you've had significant success with uh, a number of startup companies. I think you are wearing the t-shirt of one of those companies today. So, So tell me, first of all, uh, you know, what made you decide to get involved with involved with a health tech company? Very different space than some of your previous endeavors. This T-shirt's a little bit of a giveaway, isn't it? It is. I'm it is. These, but I like it. Tech entrepreneurs. Y- yeah, you know. So I mean, it actually, kind of goes back to this period. I sold my last company, which was a company called Bizzo in the in the B two B marketing and data space. Sold it to LinkedIn. I was running the marketing solutions business at LinkedIn for about three years, left to be dad. And I've got three young daughters and had been doing startups the entire time. You know, they were, they were uh, from infancy all the way to, you know, uh, now my eldest is 12 and I wanted to spend time with them and I wanted to get to know them better. And, and as I was, you know, learning about them learning how, how to how to be a great dad and and you know cook dinner and pick them up from school and all that stuff i recognized that i still had a thirst for entrepreneurship and i still had energy to put into something but i didn't want to leave them unless it was for something that really needed to exist in the world right i didn't want to leave every day and go work really hard. Like these startups are hard, right? It's always, it's always a full-time job, as you know. And, and so that really set me on this journey to find things that matter and, and find problems to solve that you know, the world needed solved. And, and that, that led me to Ginger. Yeah, so, so um, you know, I know that Ginger has had a particular focus in recent months, you know, as has Headspace Health, on adolescent mental health. Uh, and I think that is fantastic. Uh, as the mother of a 15-year-old daughter myself, I certainly saw firsthand the toll that COVID um, and the, the associated isolation took on my daughter. 
Um, and, you know, I know that it impacted many others um, very, very deeply. So, so can you talk a little bit about the focus on adolescent teen health and, and what you all are doing there? We started in the adult space and have built a system designed to deliver far more care than the traditional system. I mean, one of the biggest problems we see in the traditional system today is that you know you, you have this huge amount of stigma. So people show up to the system too late. And by the time they get there, they're they're acute, they have serious needs, but there just aren't enough providers. You know, the the the, the time it takes someone to find a therapist that whether it takes their insurance or not is, you know, it, that's, that's almost like you're, you're lucky to find anyone, let alone someone who takes your insurance, let Absolutely. alone someone who's a good fit for w- what you're doing. Right. Yeah. And as we were, as we were continuing to scale that system, we just continue to hear stories again and again about people who are struggling to find their adolescence support. And as we dug further into that, two things really struck us. One was it's even worse for adolescent support than it is for adult support. So, you know, the fact it takes six weeks to find somebody on average in the adult world, it's even worse in the adolescent world. But, but two is, as you look at, as you look at the, the research, most mental health conditions start in adolescence. Yeah. But it starts in that sort of 13 to early 20s time range. And so we realized just how important it was, both because the supply demand imbalance is worse, but also because that's this is when you really have to get a hold of these things before they get worse. It was super important that we started to support this population. Yeah, it's it's really an opportunity, I think, to help people learn early how to manage uh, their mental health, right? That's exactly right. And, and as we get into why did we bring gender together with, with Headspace to create Headspace Health, that's a huge part of it, that, that we recognized as, as a society, we have to start thinking about our brain health much earlier. Absolutely. And thinking about, you know, it just like we think about our, our physical health, just like we think about why do we brush and floss our teeth every day? Yep. Because we need them to last our whole life, right? The same thing with mental health, same thing with resilience and, and meditation and mindfulness. It's all about preparing ourselves for life, for, for the ups and downs that, that exist in life and making sure that we've built the, the mechanisms to manage through all those things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as I understand it, and please correct me if I'm wrong, you know, Headspace really focuses uh, on prevention a bit in the behavioral health realm and, and, you know, helping to build and develop skills around resilience. Is that right? And, and, you know, how did that sort of begin? That's correct. The, the vast majority of why people use Headspace today is to build resilience, to uh, build a mindfulness practice that helped them manage mild to moderate anxiety, s- stress, depression, and, and you see it in the results. So it's a very, you know, it's been a very science-based company from the beginning. And, you know, people who even only meditate for 10 days already start to see s- significant reduction in depression, reduction in anxiety. Those who use it for 30 days or more, they're seeing 30, 40% reductions in anxiety levels. I mean, this is, this is an amazing ability for your brain to manage some of these, these needs with a little bit of practice. It doesn't take much. People use it for sleep reasons. So there's a, there's a huge percent of the population that uses it to help them sleep better. And, and that, that creates a forward loop where if you're sleeping better, you're better able to manage stress and anxiety, which helps you sleep better, which helps you better manage stress and anxiety. And and some of those positive reinforcement loops are what, what mindfulness resilience, it's all about. It's all about creating the habits that through your life allow you to, to stay healthy and allow you to, you know, uh, keep anxiety, depression, other mental health illnesses from getting acute 
which once they get acute, it, it, it's very difficult to manage. It takes a lot more work to, to help support that. Just like any other chronic condition, right? Correct. Once it becomes acute, it's much more difficult to manage. That's yeah. Exactly. So that really, that really resonates with me. You know, I, for, for years I had trouble sleeping and it was not until I focused very significant attention on sleep hygiene and, um, how to be consistent around that, that that started to improve. And therefore my sort of stress levels and anxiety levels throughout the day, I think started to improve. I was exactly the same way, but my first startup, I did not have the right sleep habits. I stayed up too late. I would think about the, the, the company right before I'd go to sleep and I'd be tossing and turning all night. And then the next day I was much less able to manage the ups and downs of, you know, all of the information you deal with as a, as an entrepreneur. Um, and, and say, you know, same goes for anybody who's dealing with stress throughout their day-to-day lives, like all of us. Right. Right. The better, the better you sleep, the more able you are to cope, the more mindful uh, you are able to be and stay in the present and, and not think about the past or the future. You're able to really manage these things better. And, and this goes back thousands of years. So, so Headspace was created by a guy named Andy Pudicombe, who, who became literally a Buddhist monk. He went, he was a, a, a Brit that, you know, went to Tibet and, and spent multiple years becoming a monk and realized just how incredible the practice of mindfulness was and how this has been used by humanity for literally thousands of years, right? It's almost like the most proven ability to keep yourself healthy throughout all these, these difficulties that life present. And his mission became teach the world about this, right? Make sure that everybody understands that that this is something that can improve their lives. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's deeply rooted in history. I think there was a, a period of time, particularly particularly here in the US where we we sort of forgot those lessons, right? We we overlooked those lessons and it's and it's a bit of a time to relearn them. 100%. It, it, it was it was never forgotten by the eastern cultures. The yeah, western right. cultures the western cultures for whatever reason you know, left these behind and it's great that we're starting to re-recognize some of the, some of our sort of ancestors understanding because, you know, we certainly, we certainly can benefit from it. Yeah. So, so you mentioned Andy, how the combination between Headspace and Ginger, now Headspace Health seems to be a, a, a pretty obvious combination in retrospect, right? You mentioned Andy, did you know him previously? How, talk, talk to me a little bit about um, how that combination evolved, right? Did you all, were you introduced to each other? Did you already know each other? You know, what did your conversations kind of look like um, in terms of, you know, whatever you're comfortable sharing? I, I think that this is, this type of thing, you know, searching for, um, the right partnership and the right combination to, to grow a company to the next level is something that a lot of innovators grapple with. And I'm interested in hear how, hearing how this happened. This one was one of those meant to be kind of stories. I think I, one of my mentors and advisors has become Jeff Weiner through the experience. He was the CEO of LinkedIn. And mm-hmm. so he you know, was both an investor in Ginger and someone who I'd reach out to with some, when I had thoughts or strategic ideas. He also happened to be very early in Headspace and uh, one of the early, you know, both investors and, and people who recognized how important this was going to be. In fact, a little sidetrack, I discovered Headspace when Andy was brought to LinkedIn as a speaker in 2014. Oh, wow. And- it was right after I was acquired, so right after the business joined LinkedIn. And I was feeling, let's just say anxious about the integration and not being the CEO anymore and, and yep. trying to figure out how to operate in this big thing. And I went to Andy's talk and I started a meditation practice and it helped me immensely. You know, I probably meditated 300 straight days or something like that. It was, it was a... Um, it was a game changer for me. Fast forward though, 
I was telling Jeff about some of the things I was thinking about strategically about how I felt like Ginger had this incredible capability, but we needed to get farther upstream. We needed to destigmatize. We needed to get people starting earlier. And he said, you know, you should really talk to the founders of Headspace. It was about a year ago, probably, you know, mid 2020 during the pandemic, you know, things were, as you can, as you remember, kind of crazy. Anyway, talked to Rich who co-founded it with Andy and it was one of those mind meld moments. We, the clear cultural alignment, clear mission alignment, really interesting fit between what they were thinking about, which was wanting to get into more serious mental health support. So actual clinical support and our needs, which was to get earlier in the process, more preventative care. Right. And that started a, you know, a year long set of conversations and it wasn't initially obvious that we'd want to do anything. The timing didn't felt right, feel right early on, but eventually, you know, we both, we both got there and, and once we did, we moved pretty quickly. It's pretty amazing when those mind meld moments happen, right? Um, they don't happen all the time. So, so, uh, you know, I think it, it, it's always smart to keep your eye out them and eye out for them and seize the moment when they do happen. But, you know, you mentioned your relationship with Jeff as, as a longtime mentor. And, um, you know, I have found that in my experience in working with early stage companies, um, working with, with leaders who have a mentor and who explicitly understand the importance of a mentor and lean into that and rely on that, uh, is incredibly important. Um, any other, any other sort of thoughts about the role that a mentor can play? I'm sure you serve as a mentor to, to companies now yourself. I think, we, we, you know, obviously entrepreneurship, like anything else, is a constant set of learnings. You're, you're, you're always, if you're open to learning, you're constantly learning. You're constantly, you know, experiencing new things. And, and what a mentor or mentors can do for you is help you recognize patterns things they've seen before, they can bring examples of how they've managed different situations. But, but I think more than that, at least for me, is someone like a Jeff who's sat in this seat can come in and you know bring how he felt about these things, right? So how he how he was able to internalize some of these things, how he brought teams together around some of these problems. So that's really valuable, but again, for my own mental health, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and for my own ability to manage these things is having a mentor that's been through it before and has sat in this seat. The second piece though that I think is really valuable is the ability to just come in emotionlessly, right? Like you look at a problem with fresh eyes, not as attached to it. And often I'm thinking about a decision and it feels hard until I'll talk to a mentor, you know, I'll mm -hmm. talk to Jeff and Jeff will make it so obvious that what I'm thinking is right or what I'm thinking is wrong, but I've been struggling with it because I'm too close to it. Yeah. And you're too, too deep soft. in to recognize it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that, that I find incredibly helpful. Someone that can just come in and say, look, why are you thinking so hard about this? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. I have, I've had the exact same experience when you're struggling, 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 and you talk it through with someone and you go at the end, you go, Oh, that, that wasn't actually as hard as I was making it. Uh, totally. That's and, right. and that's, you know, invaluable, right. That kind of support. Yeah, totally. So, so tell us a little bit about, um, the latest and greatest with the Ginger and he uh, Headspace merger, now Health, Headspace Health. What are you most excited about doing right now? Uh, what do you see coming down the road? Well, right now, you know, we've been closed for just under a month at this point. And so right now it's all about bringing two cultures together. And right. how do we create the best environment for success, for growth, for, you know, distributing our capabilities and awareness around the world. It, it's, 
such an important problem to solve, but it has to start with us building a, a team and infrastructure that can scale and can work together effectively. So that's that's a lot of the focus right now. Yeah, no small task. I mean, how do you approach that? I mean, you said you said initially when you you and Andy talked or and you and Eric talked, it was or Rich talked, it Rich, was yeah. you know very much uh, alignment, right? You you know you shared a lot of the same values. Even so, I suspect that a combination like that has its challenges. How, how do you think about that? How do you approach it? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's very insightful. That's right. I mean, the, the starting point of having two cultures and missions and being so aligned, it creates a foundation for success, right? It, 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 it's, it's kind of like a marriage. Like if, if you have two people that are really effective together, they, they get along really well, they have the foundational values in alignment. Then when you go through the hard times, you have things to, to lean on, right? You've got that core alignment to lean on. Right. And that's, it's, it's very similar here where we have really strong, like the reasons that our employees are at each company before the merger are the same. Yeah. Right? They're here for the right reasons. They're here because they want to change the world in a positive way. Mm-hmm. Then when you get into the merger itself, it's complicated. It's messy, right? It, there, there are, there are, Lots of people who are going to have different titles. There are lots of people who might have a similar role today, and one of them is going to have to take a slightly different role, and they may not want that different role as much as they wanted this role. Yep. And you know, we're fortunate that this is a merger of growth, not of synergy, right? We're not looking to call pull costs out of the system. We're looking to figure out how we best grow. So that makes it easier because you don't have a bunch of people that need to lose their jobs or anything. Right. But they're still going to have to take on some different roles. And that hits ego, that hits, you know, their what they thought they would be doing. Change is always hard. So that's right what we're in the middle of right now. So, how, you know, getting people into the best seat for the company, hopefully the best seat for them moving forward. But sometimes that's tough. So I love the fact that that was the first thing you said. That was the number one important thing. Cause it's really the foundation, right? It wasn't like, we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to expand into this new market. We're going to hit this revenue target. It was, we're going to get this integration, right. From a culture and a values perspective, because the rest comes from that. Right. Totally. And we're going to make mistakes, right. We're, we're, we're trying to not overthink it early in early days. Like let's, put the two teams together and integrate the things we know need to be integrated, but, but try to be careful about everything else because we want to learn. We want to understand mm-hmm. what the needs are and what's going to work and what's not. And once we figure that out, then move quickly to integrate, you know, uh, properly once we have the answers, but, but, you know, so important to me that there's full alignment on where are we going, right? So what's the joint mission and vision? What are our, cultural tenets and our values. Because if you get all that right and get everybody aligned around that, you can accomplish incredible things. That's right. That's right. Um, So so before we wrap up, tell me about your view of some of the biggest challenges that innovators in the healthcare space in particular face. There are a number of them. When I, when yes, I, there are. <laughs> when I, my, my wife has been in healthcare her whole career. Yes. And she, when I was like, you know, I'm thinking of this company that's in the health, health tech space, which I've never done before. Yeah. She's like, A, up. yeah, she's like, it's twice as hard. Uh, and you can totally do it, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's challenging. And I would say what I've learned in the last sort of three plus years doing it is, is one, and if you're doing something that requires both technology and delivery of care, those two things are often at odds. That's right, yep. Right, so managing growth, you know, Ginger alone has grown three X per year, multiple years running. So managing growth in that tech, and, and 
you know, traditional delivery uh, at the same time is hard. It, it's hard to, to match that, you know, the, the sort of supply demand. It's hard to match the step function and growth. In particular, it's hard when you have regulatory environments that don't align with, with fast growth. Yeah. Right. The, the state by state regulations that we have to deal with makes our supply demand, our, our, our supply chain extremely complicated. It's incredibly burdensome, incredibly burdensome, incredibly burdensome. The, the infrastructure, the regulatory infrastructure just does not keep up with the technology and the demands, right, of, of innovators. And, the, and part of the reason that's so hard is we spend so much time, energy, money solving for that. And all of that could go to care. If, mm-hmm. if the, the system was set up more elegantly. If That's if a great the, point. You know, and so there's all these people that aren't getting care today. And so much of it is that our system just isn't designed properly. Which, which is, it's frustrating. And that's the world we live in. So we have to innovate through that, around that, over that, within that, right? To make sure that we're doing things legally, but we're doing things in a way that help you know, us make sure we can deliver more care. So that's, you know, I would say one is the, the combination of tech and, and care is complicated. The regulatory environment's complicated. And then I think, you know, anytime you're dealing with people who are, who have a healthcare need, that's complicated also. It's, it's kind of like, you know, in the tech world, you know, when we were, trying to solve B2B marketer problems. It's like, you know, okay, so there's a bug that makes it not quite as effective. It's like, all right, so what, right? They're, they're, they're not, not gonna... impacting an individual in a, in a very... Exactly, right? When, yeah. when yeah. somebody, for whatever reason, doesn't get connected to their therapist, it can have significant outcome, you know, um, ramifications. High stakes. So yeah, much higher stakes. And, yeah. and, and that's also a challenge in healthcare that, that you're dealing with people and their lives and their, their um, happiness. And so to me, it just implies a next level of members firstness to, to what we're doing. We, we have to make sure that we're always thinking about what is the experience that our members are going through right now. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, any small piece of advice or large piece of advice that you would give to a brand new healthcare innovator in entering the space? Give them a lot of advice. One is I'd say, make sure that you focus. I see a lot of healthcare innovators try to go too broad, too fast and yeah. dilute their core value props. So stay focused. It's a huge industry with huge amount of need. So there's no reason to go too broad, too fast. Be really good at that one thing that you're trying to be really good at and, you know, get that to scale. Yeah. I like it. I like it. All right, Russ, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. I wish you and Headspace Health all the best, and I'm really looking forward to staying in touch. Same here. Thank you so much for having me. All right. Till next time, everyone.